Welcome to the Heroic Investing Show. As first responders, we risk our lives every day. Our financial security is under attack. Our pensions are in a state of emergency. A single on-duty incident can alter or erase our earning potential instantly and forever. We are the heroes of society. We are self-reliant and we need to take care of our own financial future. The Heroic Investing Show is our toolkit of business and investing tactics on our mission to financial freedom. Welcome to the Heroic Investing Show, a podcast for first responders, members of the military, veterans, and anyone looking to improve their financial future and gain some freedom with their time. We teach America's heroes how to build passive income, build their startup business, and safely grow wealth through real estate and other alternative investments. We help current and prior first responders put protections, systems, and a team in place to help them build a life where they can focus on their passion, that service or product that they are uniquely gifted to share with others, making the world a better place for all of us. My name is Gary Pinkerton, and I co-host this show with Jason Hartman. This is episode 228, Heroic Investing 228. Today we're turning the tables yet again, and you'll hear me on the Tactical Living podcast. So if you haven't made it over to Tactical Living yet, you've got to hear Ashley and her husband, Clint Walton. So their goal is to serve first responders and members of the military. And obviously that's the same Uh, audience that we uh, try to serve here on Heroic Investing. So please go over and check out their uh, podcast as well. So Ashley is a certified uh, life and business personal coach, and her husband, Clint, is a full-time police officer uh, in Southern California. And he works in an elite tactical unit that uh, he wasn't able to talk much about. Uh, but on their podcast, the two of them talk about things like what it's like to be the, the wife of a police officer. And Clint joins many of the podcasts to give his perspective as well. Together, they share stories and recommendations that work well to live a balanced life. Whether you're looking for tactical approaches for health and fitness, learning spiritual discipline, improving intimacy, or building knowledge around current business challenges, this podcast is for you. And they're just an awesome group to spend some time together with on podcasts. I had a great time on their podcast. And then we turned the tables immediately following that. And next episode, you'll hear uh, all about their story uh, as I had the pleasure of having them on Heroic Investing. Thank you so much and enjoy this episode of me being interviewed on Tactical Living Podcast. 911, what's the nature of your emergency? Welcome to the Tactical Living Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley Walton. And I'm your co-host, Clint Walton. Today, we are super excited because we are sitting in front of Mr. Gary Pinkerton. Gary, how are you? I'm doing awesome. Thanks so much for inviting me on. We are so happy to have you. This gentleman is probably the first person that I have ever met that I knowingly know was on a submarine. I know, and I found out about that. I'm like, man, I want to find out all I can about just your life on a submarine that had to be so interesting super exciting he, he also retired as a captain after spending 26 years in the u.s navy and he's now a wealth strategist and before we get into a little bit about what you're doing now if it's okay gary if you take the listener through a little bit about your backstory sure and i don't want to scare everyone by saying that i have to start as a kid and, and i won't go too far <laughs> Um, but I grew up in Southern Illinois on a dairy farm and I learned a lot about hard work. And I also learned, uh, well, I experienced a lot associated with high interest rates that most people, if they don't remember the mid 1980s, don't have any clue what we're talking about unless they also visited, you know, somewhere like the Weimar Republic in the, in the, you know, before World War II, uh, or Zimbabwe. Right. So it's just something that's foreign. Like we talk about high interest rates in America And we're thinking about the mid 80s where interest rates were 18, 20 percent on loans. And and so my father somehow, I don't even know how this happened, but he bought our farm in the mid 60s for, you know, about 60 for, you know, about 65 dollars an acre. And he sold it in the late uh, the, the late 70s. 
uh, I'm sorry, for the early 80s, like 83 or 84, uh, for over $2,000 an acre and wow. barely got out with a shirt on his back. And, you know, so just imagine that, that price appreciation. And the reason is because interest rates just devalued all of that, right? And we took on a lot of debt that had to be covered when we sold the property. But, um, you know, we, we had these two people, advisors who would show up from time to time. One was the banker and we always felt like he was saving us because he would always give us this new low interest rate loan with a teaser rate and it would solve our problem, which is that this monster of interest rate was eating us alive. And the other guy that would show up was the insurance guy, the life insurance guy. And, and my parents would always be super stressed when he would show up. And then, uh, and it's because they knew, you know, he was going to tell them something that they would evaluate as truthful and they knew they needed it. And it meant another kind of bill or saving pocket basically. Right. And so I kind of grew up that way and not understanding why did we lose the farm? We worked so hard. And, you know, when I, we were living in a trailer for two years on our family's, uh, you know, on relatives property. And I didn't have any way to go to college. And so I was luckily working my tail off and got um, uh, an opportunity to go to the Naval Academy for free, which was the most important part. And so I did it. And then uh, for many, for 20, 25 years, I was really driven. I was driven by service. Uh, I really loved being on submarines and the challenges associated with that. I also knew it was going to provide me a brighter future in the W2 world if I went that way. Um, but really being honest with myself, I was driven by safety and security and comfort and so so many of my clients are in that same path. You know, I do X for a living. I don't like it. Why, why don't you like it? Because uh, I never really wanted to do that, but it's what pays the bills. And I'm scared to not have that money coming in to pay the bills, right? We have a, we have a standard of living we're accustomed to, right? Mm -hmm. and, so, and so I just saw so many people out there like that when I was getting ready to transition out. I, I left the military four or five years early for numerous reasons. Most of them were family related. Um, and I also lost a tremendous amount in the markets in 2008 because I had no idea what I was doing and I wanted to make some changes and so as I was leaving command of my submarine my wife wanted to get her career up and running and so I knew I was I was leaving the military and uh, you know it's a little bit longer story but I ended up really really being passionate about entrepreneurship about helping other people find the path that I've now found your goals and things in life uh, um, adopt or adapt right I'm like I, I don't know in 2013 when I started making this transition if I really thought I was gonna be so inspired about entrepreneurship and helping people the way I do, but I am, and I'm just going to see how far this road goes. I love it. I love it. So in retrospect now, do you think that, that, that shift for you into that shift for you into this world of finances is, is only attributed to that, that past as a childhood? I know that was the first thing that you made mention of. Well, it, it is, but it's not about the negative side of it. It's, it's mm -hmm more about the positive side. So uh, I thought for a long period of time that, well, so back to the comfort thing, right, of W2, like why do I wanna make money, right? Everybody has a reason to make money when it's beyond just food, shelter, and clothing. And my driving thing for a long time that I told myself was that I don't want my kids to have the experience that I had as a child. Like I don't want them having to hand me down clothes. I don't want them, you know, showing up to school in the beat up old cars, you know, the embarrassing kind of things as a kid, right? But um, you know, now that I've gone through a whole lot of work with coaches and, and things like the great things that you two bring to this world, um, I kinda, you know, I realized that it's, uh, it's not that at all. It, it's that um, I wanted my, I wanted to have the opportunity to help people have what I actually did have. Like, I, I you know, I was, I was so caught up on being embarrassed about the financial side of things. I didn't realize what I really had as a kid. Mm -hmm. And I, what I had was 24 seven with my dad and the guy who was my hero. And I learned so much from that guy and so many kids out there right now don't have that. And so many parents are just really wish they could provide that for their kids. You know, many people out there, I said, you know, I commented, they're in jobs they don't like doing things they don't like, but there's a lot of other people who are doing things they do want to do. Like they're in the right field. They, they are actually in the field where they demonstrate unique genius and have mastery skills but they're in an environment that they're not controlling, right? So it's about the drive to work. It's about being away from their kids. And maybe it's about somebody saying, you got to be here on Saturday, or I don't like your work, even though inside, you know, it was the best work and they make you do it their way, right? So it's just about not having control and not doing it your way. And, you know, really where my passion comes from is that, and, and I'm not exactly sure why, they're so inspired about our founding fathers. Um, I can, you know, when I remember back to the really amazing things about my childhood, it's about, 
Um, it's about that entrepreneurship. It's about small business and, and people, uh, all my neighbors, like if there was a problem in the community where we didn't have something, we couldn't go to Amazon for it. So somebody just started a little business and solved that, right? <laughs> and, and we weren't in, worried about somebody else giving us something or the government giving us something. We just solved it. And uh, I can remember the 4th of July, the, uh, the 200th, you know, the centennial, like, you know, I can remember riding my red, white, and blue bicycle in the parade and just really being inspired by that. Well, you know, I've gone down this journey of, of you know, studying um, the Constitution and what our founding fathers went through. And I mean, those guys were started an experiment that was nowhere else on the globe, like, you know, life, liberty and property, or we called it pursuit of happiness because we didn't think they'd understand property, right? But it's about knowing that if you produce something, your family gets to see the benefits of it. And the more you produce, it gets to see the benefits of it. And the more you produce, the bigger the results. And so I'm inspired by things like Atlas Shrugged and uh, Gar- Galt's Gulch, you know, and, and just, a, you know, a society that these guys started and that's still working. And I think if we treat it right and we get enough people inspired about it, it'll keep going. Yeah, that that's beautiful. And you, as you listen to this, you you can't see this. So I am going to point it out. But as Gary has been talking this whole time, he is just full of so much light and so much energy that that I can feel just coming from him. And I know that someone is passion driven about something when they can talk, and I can feel it the way that I do when when you're talking about this. And yeah. if you don't mind, Gary, if you can talk a little bit about what does that look like for you right now in terms of the things that you do to create that own financial freedom around yourself? So what does my, what does financial freedom feel like to me and what does it mean? For you. Yeah. So it's, it's the opportunity. Um, It's the opportunity to share my unique genius, like to get in the role and just follow, get in the role and just follow what my passion tells me is right. Like the reason I get impassioned about what to talk about on these podcasts and the reason I show up with no preparedness at all is because I've learned to just listen to how my body's responding. You know, over time I've talked about one thing and it's lit me up and, or even when I'm in the middle of a conversation answering this exact question, I just have learned to follow my emotions to take me in the, in, you know, in the right direction. And, and so one of the things that I'm passionate about is, okay, let's go to the really far out there side of this, right? Like what's the meaning of life? <laughs> you know, I'm not talking Monty <laughs> Python, funny movie. I'm talking like, why are we here? And I have no idea what the answer to that question is. It'll be fun to figure out with other people. Um, but I do believe that it's, you know, my answer to that question is, I don't know exactly, but I think it's to move the football down the field, like just add something positive to future generations and, and then move on. Maybe as another person coming back, who knows, but Mm -hmm. better after you've, you've left it. And, and I think that we as humans are amazing animals to figure things out on our own and to be innovative if left, if given the opportunity to do so but we've surrounded ourselves with all these boxes that are just really sad. Like I want to keep up with the Joneses. Like I'm working three jobs just because my neighbor across the street has a car that I don't have and I'm embarrassed. Right. As opposed to like setting yourself in a situation, understanding what's really important by working with coaches and, and then um, designing your life so that you can pursue unique genius. Like I think everyone out there has something they're a genius at. And do we really need a genius at basket weaving? I would imagine we do somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm probably not their best customer, but I know there's millions of people out there that are. But we'll never find that person and they'll go to their grave with the music inside. I don't remember exactly who I should accredit that quote for, but I love it. (laughs) Um, Because they're going to go to the grave with the music inside because they have, we haven't, they're going to go to the grave with the music inside because they have, we haven't, they haven't learned and and no one has helped them figure out how to set up your life to do what you want to do. I help people all the time who are in the wrong situation, but the right field, um, redesign their lives. So let's say they're a 1099 employee working for the same company they used to be W2 with, and they're working two or three days a week, or they're working remotely from home, uh, you know, when their child um, needs them at soccer camp or whatever, right? So it's just, it's a minor shift to allow them to pursue unique genius and actually want to pursue it because they're passionate about it now. So why would that be important to go from a W2 to a 1099 as an employee? Sure. Great question. I think uh, Robert Kiyosaki does one of the best um, uh, um, answers to that question in his, in his book, Cashflow Quadrants. And Tom Wheelwright in his book, who's you know, obviously with, with Kiyosaki, um, uh, anyone who listens to my podcast knows that I, you know, I'm a real estate junkie. So I, I, I have a lot of great uh, memories with Robert and, and Tom Wheelwright. But you know, they talk about 
uh, it's not it's not what you're doing or what field you're in. It's how you set up your own corporate life, right, or your own your own structure. And the U.S. tax system pushes you to be um, an a self-employed person to own your own business, right? To be an entrepreneur. And the people who pay the highest taxes, well, okay, the highest taxes are probably self-employed if you don't know to go beyond that. Uh, but, but W-2 employee and 1099, pretty high costs, right? But if you can get to big business or we get to the investor level, um, but you know, to answer your question, I'm kind of beating around the bush, but to answer your question is that you can take tax deductions for things and you can control your life. Probably the most important thing is controlling your life, right? If somebody says, no, no, you have to be at work these hours, you say, hey, read the tax code. If you tell me when I can and can't come to work, then that's a W-2 employee and you owe me all these other benefits and they'll shut up and they'll get out of your way, right? Uh, mm -hmm. because, because the tax code understands. Like if we're gonna give you the benefits and not have the person have to pay social security for you, then they can't tell you what to do. And that's really what we're after is being able to live life on our own terms. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great answer. And that, that explains a lot. Um, I'm just curious, because we have so many people, Gary, that are either medically retired, they're naturally retired, um, they're trying to transition from active service life into civilian life. So what advice would you give to these people who, who maybe want to try to make a living? We actually just had an interview with my friend and in our podcast, I'm sorry, in our live Facebook group. And he had made mention of how difficult it was for that transition of like going to war in Iraq and then coming home. And literally he like fucking worked out at um, Hallmark, like selling greeting cards and stacking Beanie Babies. And it's like, wow. what the hell? So what advice would you give to somebody like that who is in that transition, who's looking to, to still make money and still hold their, their dignity? Yeah. You know, some of that is sadly coming from, you know, medical condition. So, um, some of that requires some, some help from psychologists and, and actual, you know, and, and MDs. Uh, and there's a great program, actually. Uh, I just interviewed the head of um, the Intrepid Society and they're, they're doing public private venture to put um, amazing, amazing centers for PTSD and for burnt victims and but mainly PTSD across the country and like 11 different geographic military geographic centers and um, but you know so that's kind of a, a road down but let's take let's just assume and, and my answer here that the person um, doesn't have some you know that they have the ability to control their own emotions and to change their world right they, they have the medical ability to do so um, and what I would tell the most important thing the biggest misconception that most people who are transitioning I believe has is that, that they're not set up well for uh, as compared to somebody who's been out in the corporate world as a civilian for those set up well for uh, as compared to somebody who's been out in the corporate world as a civilian for those 20 years like I'm 20 years behind everybody else mm. and it could not be more the opposite like just go study um, how Marine Corps officers do in the corporate leadership world they're unbelievable it's a statistical anomaly like they I don't know, like my, my numbers are going to be way off here about like, you know, 50% of, of corporations from, you know, in the medium size had, you know, they, they skyrocketed under the helm of uh, a Marine Corps officer. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And, and you just see those things in all aspects of people who have been in service. So, you know, think about the skills we do have, right? Like we know how to get up on time, go to work, um, you know, and I'm not just talking about military, like I, I believe and everyone on my podcast knows that I believe that people who are in service in uniform as a police officer, firefighter, EMT, it's all the same. Families 24 seven um, to do the right thing. Right. And I think it's scarier out there in on American streets in some cities than it is where in things that we do in, in the military. I mean, okay. Landing at Normandy on D day is pretty scary. Um, but that's not what most of us do every day. Um, so I think, I think that people don't value the, the just being put together and understanding how to follow and being self-motivated. So, you know, kind of just get the confidence that you're going to kill it out there. Even if you don't have the five years of experience building widgets, like the guy who's building widgets that you're, you know, you're competing with, um, you're going to, I mean, you're going to be loved at your company because you're going to go well beyond the effort of everybody else. You know, the, the, the key to being successful, and again, I'm stealing this, this analogy or quote from somebody else, but it's just getting up one more time than the other guy did. You know, you just, we all get up and dust ourselves off, and eventually people are like, I'm not doing that anymore. 
but the, the people who are service providers get up one more time and they succeed. So that's the biggest thing. Another thing is that is um, entitlement, uh, not entitlement, um, comfort, right? I, I mentioned the comfort drug, like that drug of having a consistent income of doing something just because it's guaranteed income or it's a government you know, job and and we don't, you know, not likely to get laid off. I mean, follow your inspiration, like take the time to get a coach, learn what, what you're on this planet to do, and then focus on that. You will be so much more happy and you'll make a ton more money. Back to my joke about the basket weaver. There are, I'm sure, basket weavers who are making millions of dollars because they're doing something the rest of us look at and go, that is amazing. I don't know how you do that, right? And that's where your unique genius is. I worked with a dear friend and coach uh, a year and a half ago and one of the one of the challenge or one of the the tasks in learning what my unique genius was was just simply saying what do other people like go ask your family um what you do crazy but uh numbers um talking with other people about complex things like things that led to this job that i do every day um and and so uh, that was a long answer, but but yeah, have the confidence that you're going to absolutely kill it out there because you've already demonstrated success in a, in a very, very hard thing that 90%, 95% of the people can't do, won't qualify to go do. Um, and then um, don't do something just because it's it's uh, safe. Um, playing safe is keeping one foot on first base and thinking you're going to get to second. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's an awesome answer. And I love that you shared the, like, ask your friends or your, your sphere of influence, what you're good at or, or what you excel in, because <clears throat> I did the same thing with my coach and it wasn't until a couple of weeks later to where I'm looking at the list and I'm like, I could be a life coach because every single thing on this list are like prime attributes that would make me a good life coach. And it sounds like a simple exercise, but I love that you touched on that because whether somebody is developing something to create passive income in addition to what it is that they do full time, in addition to what it is that they do full time while they're in transition of creating that income for themselves and, and drive into that passion and lean into that passion, it, it's such a, a great place to start because we don't often consider those things until we have the opinions from the people who know us the best, better than we know ourselves sometimes. And in saying that when somebody is willing to lean into that and to take those first steps, what is the best advice that you can give them for first responders, military service members to start to attain that financial freedom for themselves? Well, uh, it's, it's about education, right? So when you're, when you're deployed or when you're, you know, at the firehouse for the, the 24 hour shift and, and nothing's, you know, nothing's taking up your time, um, you know, stay away from social media and television and study, right? Study something that you, that, uh, well, heck I, I would study, um, just, biographies of extremely, extremely successful people because there's all kinds of things you pull out of a, a biography about Rockefeller and and it's about work ethic and and it's about you know how they thought about things but you'll also you know figure out that they they're a lifelong learner like every successful person I've ever met is a lifelong learner they're sitting in the front of the room at a seminar um, listening to their buddies talk about stuff that they know about and they teach themselves but they're still going to pick up nuggets here and there and um, so it's really, it's all about studying, but, you know, I would definitely look at the things that have been proven successful ways of protecting and growing wealth across the globe for generations, right? And real estate is definitely one of those. Owning a successful cash flowing business that's in, uh, in an industry that is not going to go away anytime soon. Like don't, don't buy the, uh, the A-Track tape player company. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't even buy... I don't know. Um, I, I'm going to come up with something dumb here, but I mean, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't come up with something that's maybe a fad, right? I would, you know, food is, is, is very popular. So sadly that one doesn't have a high success rate. <laughs> um, but, but a company that provides staples or, or a company that provides services that you just can't automate, right? Like iRobot's not going to replace the cleaning services where they show up and clean your house. That's just not going to happen. So, you know, having a an, something in an industry that's not a flash in the pan, that's a good cash flowing business, car wash, right? It's probably still going to be around for a few years. Um, and um, so that, that's, that's one big thing is pick a, you know, own a company, pick a company that you've well researched that you know will be good. And then for passive investments, you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of rental real estate in some manner because we're, we're not to this point where we're, we're going to teleport to our, you know, to a home somewhere and not need food, shelter, and clothing and shelter is mm -hmm. a big one. So, I mean, it's not going away. Right. 
and they're not making more land. So, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's going to always be a universal need for that stuff. Yeah, that, that's beautiful. And I know we're nearing the end of this, but if you can just share with us what your biggest goal is that you're looking to achieve within the next 12 months. Wow. Um, making, uh, this will be a little bit vague, but um, expanding the strategic relationship I have expanding relationships I have with strategic partners. I, I'm uh, focusing really hard on, um, I think about life as, as, you know, my social environment and my ability to influence people as having like um, concentric fences, if you will. And the inner fences where you have your, you know, your racehorses, right there. Those are your raving fans. Those are the people that you're so like-minded that you lose time when you're talking with them, right? You lose track of time. And you just know that nothing's going to be misinterpreted and that your interests are going to be aligned and there's no underlying secret interests to try to use each other in a relationship and they're in a relationship. And those are the kind of people that I want in that inner circle. So I really want to focus on those individuals and add value to their world um, because I, I firmly believe that you get everything in life you want if you just help enough other people get what they want. And that one I can quote correctly. That's Zig Ziglar. Mm-hmm. He's a huge, an amazing guy. Um, so that's what I'm focusing on is strategic relationships with partners and building two more people on my personal team of, of um, insurance-based financial stuff. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Now, apart from people being able to check out your podcast, which I would highly recommend on um, heroicinvesting.com, is there any other way that people can get into contact with you if they have any questions or maybe want to yeah. hire you as, as a financial coach? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, um, and, I, and I appreciate you asking that question. Um, the easiest way is just my website. It's not a, an amazing thing. So if anybody out there is really, really good at uh, web development and, and uh, marketing, marketing, love to talk with you. Um, but you can just go to GaryPinkerton.com, GaryPinkerton.com. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, HartmanMedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.